Good evening, and welcome to Skeptalk, the monthly speaker series hosted by the Bay Area Skeptics. Before tonight's presentation, a few words about Bay Area Skeptics. As North America's oldest skeptical organization, we are dedicated to promoting critical thinking, logic, and rational thought. In the 1970s and 80s, scientists such as Carl Sagan and magicians such as James Randi established the scientific skepticism movement out of concern about the popular fondness for pseudoscience and the lack of public science literacy. Scientific skepticism embraces evidence-based civil discourse on health, education, consumer protection, and especially the investigation of extraordinary claims. Using the scientific method, we hope to promote skeptical inquiry to reduce irrational thinking in society. This talk is supported by Bay Area Skeptics members such as you. Please visit us at baskeptics.org or join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Meetup. Consider supporting us through convenient monthly donations via Patreon. Patrons receive premiums such as discounts and free t-shirts for our annual Skeptical Conference. But more importantly, members help us make the world just a little more reasonable and rational. And now, tonight's speaker. Good evening. I'm Eugenie Scott. I'm the president of Bay Area Skeptics. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. John Mashey. John grew up in a farm in rural Pennsylvania, got off the tractor and went to the University of Pennsylvania intending to become a physicist. Now, unfortunately for physics, the 1960s were a period of great excitement about this new thing called computer science. And as John puts it, he got the bug. So he became a computer science master's and later PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. Upon graduation, he was snapped up by Bell Labs. He spent 10 years at Bell working on Unix and other projects. He has sometimes described himself as an ancient Unix guy and in fact has been honored by the Unix community by being awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Usenix Association. The um, award was not this card. Uh, in 1994, the Usenix Association celebrated the 25th anniversary of Unix with a deck of cards of founding fathers and mothers, and John is featured prominently, Ten of Hearts. Did I mention he was a Unix guy? Right. I have a neighbor who retired from the technology field and I invited him to watch this talk and he wrote me back, quote, John and I overlapped in the Unix community, but he was a big famous guy and I was a student, so the recognition is likely unidirectional. John eventually saw the light and sensibly left <clears throat> Bell Labs for California in the early 1980s and worked for a number of companies, both in hardware and software. He ended up at Silicon Graphics as chief scientist and vice president. Among other things he did during that time is coined the phrase big data in the sense that that term is used today. But of course, he's not speaking for Bay Area skeptics tonight because he is a big famous guy, as my neighbor would have put it, in the computer science field, but for his work in the skeptical community. You very likely read articles by him in Skeptical Inquirer, and he is a scientific and technical consultant for CSI. His claim to fame in our world is the work he has done researching climate science deniers in support of climate scientists like Mike Mann, the hockey stick guy, referring to the shape of global warming uh, during the last 1,000 years now. Mike Mann has been sued repeatedly. Uh, by some very powerful political figures, and John has been there to support him. Mike refers to John as one of the good guys. He has doggedly researched from voluminous sources and the judicious use of the FOIA procedure, the scientific failings and, scholars and poor scholarship of climate science deniers. He has also shown the links among the individuals, their astroturf organizations, and the big money that funds them. In an interview in Science a few years back, John said, quote, Naomi, referring to Naomi Oreskes, Naomi's a friend and she gets death threats. Mike Mann's a friend and he gets death threats. That pisses me off. And when John gets pissed off about something, he does something about it. I think you will find his presentation tonight very interesting and very informative. So John, 
Welcome to Bay Area Skeptics. Hey, thanks. It's great to be here. So uh, I, I do have to make one minor correction, though. There's Please do. There's a difference between Penn State and the University of Pennsylvania. Did I say Penn State? No, you said University of Pennsylvania. Ah, you're a Penn <laughs> State guy. Yes. Ah. Nittany well, Lions. Okay. Not just like Mike Mann. Okay. So <laughs> that 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 is an error one would not want to make. I apologize. That's right. You gotta be careful with that. <laughs> right. I read a whole bunch of stuff about you online. I was trying to remember where it was we met, and I'm pretty sure we met back in the mid 2000s or so, uh, because we were both on a climate science uh, communications uh, uh, web uh, listserv. And there was this guy that kept showing up saying, wow, I just found this really interesting thing about the Heartlands Foundation. And I, I looked in here and here and it was all these really obscure references. And I got their 990 and I really examined, I thought, man, this guy really does his homework. I mean, we were joking uh, before we came on about, ha ha, you do your research, which has become something of a punchline these days. But the kind of research John does is not what most people these days are saying when they, <laughs> meaning when they say doing my research. So John, let's hear what you have to tell us tonight about your topic, the title of which I forgot, but it has to do with... <sighs> Well, let me just do that. <laughs> just do that. That'll be on the title slide. Jay? <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Jeannie. So, yeah, the title here is Machineries of Doubt, and I include climate cigarettes and confusion, but I've added a little bit about COVID anti-vax uh, confusion because it's weirdly related. The general idea is money comes into the machine and what comes out is fog over science. And the, the gears, the, the gears I've studied a lot are from big fossil and big tobacco, which are oddly interconnected. Uh, and I'll talk about why that is and how. Now, I hope some of you have heard talks by a couple of my old buddies, uh, Mark Boslow and John Cook. My talk is certainly related and, and consistent with them, but goes in some different directions. So we'll do that. Oops. So uh, Jeannie talked a bit about my background. Uh, I always put a slide in about background because if, if you read the Wikipedia entry on me, you might say, wait, this guy's a computer scientist. What's he doing in, in this climate and tobacco turf? So uh, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction, a little more history. And the way I'd put it is I'm an old time skeptic from sort of when I was in first grade. Uh, and then I was a computer scientist and a corporate executive. And I stumbled into this alternate universe of climate denial. And then I got involved with tobacco control experts and found there was a lot of similarity there. i uh, also give you some background of some of my favorite books and some of my blog posts uh, I, so that you can go track uh, background information down if you want. I do a little bit about climate change science, but generally this is not a talk about the science. Um, this is a the talk more about the anti-science. That is, who does doubts? What are the organizations? Who are the people? How does the funding work? What's the relationship with ideology? The goal of this stuff is to avoid unwanted policy and get around the science that they don't like. Now, the interesting thing is tobacco anti-science created a lot of the tactics and it was inherited by the environmental anti-scientists uh, and sometimes the same people. So, for instance, the Heartland Institute is a big climate denial place, but it also does things like Joe Camel was innocent, Mercury's OK, there's no warming and so forth. Truly sad thing is, and I'll talk about this, um, is when I was a kid, uh, Science was pretty nonpartisan, but over the last 20 to 30 years, uh, certain groups have managed to attach certain kinds of anti-science to political identity, and that's really pretty sad. So what I do is help defend science and scientists. I investigate the machineries and I try to throw rocks into gears. And uh, so I've gotten a few enemies. I've gotten sued. And, you know, that's life in this turf. Uh, what I do is pretty specialized and it's not something I'd recommend everybody go do. But the idea is to expose things that are useful for people to know. 
Now, I'm going to give you some warning. Some of the slides are eye charts. Don't be fearful of them. They're to illustrate the complexity of what's underneath and what one has to study to really know what's going on. Uh, and in particular, I'm an old skeptic. I always like to see references and backup. So they're here, right? So if you need to uh, go look up the talk on YouTube after it's there and you can go find the URLs and go look at the, the backup, right? I mean, there's literally many hundreds of pages of research and thousands of references to things. Okay, so... Uh, Jeannie mentioned I grew up on a small farm. I was founded about 1860. I was born in 1946, so baby boomer. If you know Western Pennsylvania, uh, gee, uh, it's the land of oil, coal, and shale. Uh, and of course, there was a lot of smog. There's a lot less now after the steel business collapsed. But when I was a kid, if you went to downtown Pittsburgh, uh, you didn't see the sun very much. And businessmen took an extra white shirt to work. It's pretty grim. Um, so now if you grew up on a farm, climate matters. Uh, it's good to keep topsoil around. Uh, uh, you have to recycle things. Uh, but fortunately, <clears throat> both of my parents were actually U.S. Army officers in World War II, and both of them already had BS degrees. And uh, that's pretty rare for that cohort. They cared about science and education. And I was very lucky that although I was on a farm, uh, we were actually right at the edge of a big suburban and very good school district. Um, so I got a pretty good education, including a couple teachers who were terrific at teaching critical thinking. Advanced Placement American History was especially good because they gave us multiple sources that disagreed with each other, and we were supposed to do research to sort things out. We could say anything if we could back it up. Uh, that was worth a lot. So, but by first grade, I was reading science fiction, and I really wanted UFOs and ESP uh, uh, similar paranormal things to be real, but I kind of doubted them. And pretty soon after that, I was reading James Randi and uh, uh, Martin Gardner and later on Carl Sagan and other other folks from PSYCOP that I'm sure lots of people uh, listening uh, are, 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 have read. So there was, six, there was seven or eight years where my plan was to become a fusion physicist because remember, I wanted something that was a better power source than all the fossil fuels around there. And I read a book that said they expected fusion to be commercial by 1990. Um, well, it didn't quite work out that way. So I went off to Penn State. I, for a long time, I was a double major in math and physics. But then I got entranced by computer science and I stopped the physics one course short of the, the BS and went on in computer science. Um, a Bell Labs director walked in and wondered if I'd heard of Bell Labs and would I consider going the industrial route? And I said, yes and yes. And I got to go over there. Now, uh, Bell Labs at that time was about 25,000 people in R&D and uh, is heaven for skeptics because uh, people were very evidence-based and very skeptical. So the Bell system was breaking up. I moved out to Silicon Valley, worked for various computer companies. Uh, as Jeannie mentioned, I coined the, the phrase big data uh, a long time ago uh, and uh, uh, did spent at least some time helping sell computers to the National Center for Atmospheric Research and other places that do climate modeling as well as all kinds of other uh, places. Uh, 1995, I subscribed to Skeptical Inquirer, and also that year, unfortunately, I had a heart attack. Uh, I used to fly 100, 150,000 miles a year around the world and talk to customers and just do all kinds of stuff. By 2000, my cardiologist said, get out of the fast line or else. So I sort of retired consulting for venture capitalists and tech companies. Then came an accident. And this is the weird accident that caused me to get into climate stuff. The Economist recommended Lomborg skeptical environmentalists. So my quick reads, you know, raised some issues. And uh, I was hiking with a friend who runs a Stanford seminar, says, oh, well, why don't you be the skeptical discussant for a seminar by uh, climate scientist Steve Schneider? You know, so I said, well, that sounds like fun. So then I studied the footnotes of uh, Lomborg's thing. And of course, his arguments just fell apart. 
but I bought a variety of books and I brought them in. And, and, and by the time I got to the, the, the seminar a month later, you know, I, my any worries I'd had had pretty much evaporated. But I brought in my stack of books I got and I showed them to Steve and I said, so what do you think of this one? And it was like, it was, oh, Fred Singer. Ugh, okay, right. Well, um, anyway, that was fun. I got to actually be a friend of Steve's uh, over the next few years. And what I did was do what a skeptic should do, which is I listed all of the arguments against human-caused global warming. And then I just did a lot of study and I kept crossing arguments off. And of course, they all kind of went away. Um, so I, over the next few years, when I wasn't doing consulting, I would be looking at um, uh, books and I watched some of the uh, early blogs. Uh, in 2005, I happened to be up in Eugene and I went to this the CSI Skeptics Toolbox. That was a lot of fun. So, but by 2006, I was wondering, gee, the science is really strong. Remember, I got a physics background. So it's like, this is solid, solid stuff. Yes, there's uncertainties here and there, but you know, we should be doing a lot about this. Well, in, in the next year, I met Naomi Oreskes at a Stanford talk, and she was just starting on the work that led to Merchants of Doubt. And that summer, she got attacked by the Viscount Christopher Moncton, uh, a serious climate denier. And I sort of helped out with her defense. And as a result, she asked me to review the first chapter of the book before she sent it off to the publisher. And I ended up actually reviewing that book all along. And uh, you'll find me in the acknowledgments if you read it. I started studying the denial machinery. I built a, a big spreadsheet that had people actions and organizations. And there were like a thousand people eventually, and maybe about 30 actions like petitions and letters and so forth, and about a hundred uh, think tanks of one kind or another. So I was starting to learn, you know, I started to get a feel from blogs about what people thought and did. And now I was digging into the machinery. Now in 2007, at Skeptical Inquirer, there was a kerfuffle where uh, Kendrick Fraser had published a, uh, a straightforward science uh, uh, paper uh, on global warming and got a firestorm of uh, letters saying, uh, cancel my subscription for this hoax. And I sort of helped them out and explained how this worked because he was, he was stunned. It was just, you know, it was such a shock that a bunch of supposed skeptics weren't thinking very scientifically. Well, by 2009, I exposed a petition uh, to the American Physical Society. I was still a, a member of this, um, where they were trying to turn its climate statement to mush. In fact, there was a series of things where science societies were being pushed by a very small set of uh, extreme uh, uh, people uh, to, to, again, cancel their climate statement. So I kind of ended up helping them out to warn them what was coming. So at least by 2010, I was talking to uh, uh, Jeannie uh, and NCSE, and we had a meeting in 2011 over at their place on climate denial because they were starting to get uh, requests from school teachers because they were getting pushes on climate uh, problems, uh, not just on evolution. And so I went over and had a nice visit with them and even survived uh, the mac and cheese lunch at uh, home homeroom, uh, which I didn't tell my cardiologist about. So also in two, 2010, I wrote a couple big reports, uh, Crescendo to Climate Gate Cacophony and Strange Scholarship in the Wegman Report. Uh, and the latter was a dissection of problems in this elaborate attack on the hockey stick that turned into a uh, a show trial in uh, the U.S. Congress. And um, turned out the report itself, well, there was plagiarism, there were falsification, there were errors, there were all kinds of bad arguments. It, it was really pretty bad, okay, right? Uh, that stirred up interest at, uh, by a reporter at USA Today, and it was a long chain of events that caused trouble for them. Well, that also got me profiled in science. Uh, the writer quoted Happer and Wegman, uh, and they weren't too happy with me, uh, which was happy for me. Uh, um, a guy named Peter Wood, who runs the National Association of Scholars, which is a, a very right-wing um, uh, scholarship group funded by 
Cokes and uh, Richard Mellon Scaife and all the same climate denial types. I wrote this blog piece attacking Mann and I in the Chronicle of Higher Education. This guy's an anthropologist who knew nothing about climate, but he wrote this attack, and that was interesting, right? So I did a report on the Heartland Institute, and as a side effect, I discovered this anonymizer called Donors Trust. Uh, I, Charles Koch has always hated the fact that when his foundations gave money to a think tank that it had to re be reported to the IRS. And so this Donors Trust was a donor advised fund that got created so that multiple donors could give money to it and then the president of it would write the checks. So now you no longer could tell who gave money to what. Uh, now, also in 2012, uh, Wegman and his helper, who was a co-author of the Wegman report, got fired from a journal they co-edited because of plagiarism. And uh, I, I and some helpers, you know, kind of kind of made that happen. Uh, he wasn't too happy about that. Uh, we had a workshop uh, that Naomi and Union of Concerned Scientists arranged in La Jolla. Uh, at Scripps, uh, really a hardship post. You sit and look at the, the Pacific Ocean and La Jolla Beach, but somebody's got to do it. It was a combination of climate people and tobacco control people with the idea that we would compare notes and we would learn from the tobacco folks who've been fighting anti-science for a lot longer than the climate folks have. And that led me to get involved with UC San Francisco's Center for Tobacco Control Research and Education, where I've been, been since. And it turns out that's actually pretty relevant. Uh, it also turned out I used some FOIAs and found that Wegman and Saeed had badly misused federal grants. They'd actually used Army and uh, Alcoholism ag uh, Agency funds to do the Wegman report, uh, you know, which didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, I ended up as a science technical consultant for CSI, and I got sued for a million dollars uh, each uh, by Wegman and Saeed. But fortunately, uh, I have friends and a climate science legal defense fund uh, uh, paid for it. And I continue to do other stuff afterwards. Okay, so let's go into some good books. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through all of this. This this is just a set of some of my favorite books. When I do this in person, I bring these books with me and pass them around. Uh, and there's a mix of policy books, uh, deep dives like dark money into the into funding, uh, uh, or the origins of some of the uh, uh, political uh, 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 movements that go on. There's there's climate stuff, there's tobacco stuff, and they're all here because these things are all interlocked in weird and wonderful ways. Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, if you recognize some of these books, that's good. But what you might do is come back to this uh, and then pick off a couple books and, uh, and take a look at them. These are all good. Uh, one disclosure, a lot of these people are friends of mine, sometimes really good friends. I also have these books. Here's about 90 books that are climate denial books. Okay? Uh, I collect these things because I like to track how ideas flow through them and who copies whom. Uh, a whole lot of them attack the hockey stick because they really don't like the obvious thing that humans have been causing global warming. And they often use a diagram that actually started in 1965 that covered a 30 by 40 mile area of central England that they like to think is globe, the whole global temperature. It wasn't but they love this diagram. So what I do if I get a new denial book is I take a look for this graph. If I find it, I know they don't know what they're doing or they uh, do and they're uh, faking it. Okay, a crucial resource is the Industry Documents Library up at uh, UCSF. It started with tobacco, but it's since added other uh, topics. And you, for instance, you can find uh, Manafort there. He's a tobacco helper. Uh, it, and you find that tobacco helpers often move to fossil fuels. And it's a really terrific resource because often the same people are involved in anti-science across these areas. Uh, and I, here's a quick thought question. I'll answer it at the end. If you just search the tobacco section alone, there's 19,000 documents. Why would that be? And I'll answer that later. 
So don't worry about reading all these. These are a bunch of the references to a sample of some of the things that I've written over the years. The things with the red tea or tobacco things, most of the rest are uh, climate related or fossil fuel things. Okay, a little bit on climate change, not much because the science is so solid. What's really clear is we're in the process of taking the global temperature outside the range of actually uh, human civilization. And uh, it's been that hot before, many millions of years ago, not hundreds of thousands of years, but not when there was a human civilization around. So um, uh, you can read science. Uh, if you like CO2 animations, uh, NOAA has a terrific one. That's one of my favorites uh, down there at the bottom. If you want to see how humans have been changing climate actually for about 8,000 years, you read Bill Ruddeman's book, Earth Transformed. Terrific multidisciplinary work. And of course, you know, there's just all the data is quite consistent and, uh, you know, it's just rock solid science. But of course, there's a lot of effort to, to uh, confuse it. Now, uh, this climate tobacco connection, uh, a, a great video is Steve Chu, you know, our ex-secretary of energy. He compared tobacco epidemiology and time lags for climate. That is, you put CO2 in the atmosphere, it doesn't warm right away, but over time it builds up and it gets there. So anyway, uh, Steve, of course, is one of the smartest guys I've ever met. I've met him a couple of times. He's old Bell Labs guy, you know, hey, good guy. Uh, we're, well worth seeing this uh, YouTube thing uh, for the comparison. So let's go into some of the arguments and debunking. And again, you, you, some of you have heard John Cook. He started this years ago, uh, but a whole lot of other people have contributed. I, I help them out now and then. And a terrific resource is the list of climate myths. And um, the... Uh, uh, I have here the first five of about 200, and these are just invaluable to have. Uh, advice I give everybody is if you run into some argument, this is the first place you go to look it up. Right? I'll talk about later, if you are a climate communicator, uh, I'll talk about how you use this in talks and, and on radio or online. Anyway, where does this junk come from? It's been debunked so many times, sometimes for 30 years. And why does it persist? And that's what the, we'll talk about the machinery that does that. Okay, now, uh, this is another chart of John Cook's, and he talks about different uh, characteristics of sinus denial. Uh, I've been using this a little while. Um, particularly, I added to the magnified minority. Now we're going to get to the COVID uh, anti-vax uh, uh, anti-science. The American Institute of Economic Research is a think tank I'd never heard of until 2013 when I saw an email to them from the main UK climate denial outfit. And it turned out they had done occasional climate denial, but they seemed very independent of the usual Coke collection of think tanks or Exxon collection. Um, but recently they were the basis for the Great Barrington Declaration, which basically said, just count on herd immunity for COVID. Don't worry about um, uh, masks or shutdowns or anything else. And they had a petition with a whole bunch of people, a whole lot like uh, some climate petitions. But if you look up the entry in DSmog of the AIER Coke transition, turns out around 2017, there was a major infusion of Coke money and an even bigger infusion of Coke-related people uh, into AIER. So it became a tentacle of the Coctopus. So let's go to basic definitions here that I'll use from now on. So science... Uh, you know, science, I use the Great Wall analogy. It gets built up brick by brick. If if one brick collapses, it's not like the whole wall collapses. It, uh, a lot of climate deniers want the, you know, one paper to completely tear everything up, and it just doesn't work that way. There's this huge consilience of evidence and, you know, immense amounts that one can read, but it's very solid stuff. 
There, of course, is pseudoscience where people really believe in something and they want to convince scientists of ideas, even though the evidence is strongly against them. And there's a lot of examples of, of these. And of course, skeptical inquirers debunk them for a long time. If you love examples of this, uh, just for fun, uh, the Journal of Scientific Exploration um, has a whole set of them. And uh, you can see the table of contents in the second URL there. I call it a dog astrology journal because my favorite example was a study of 500 Parisian puppies where they found astrology worked just as well for them as it did for humans. And they thought it worked well. The weird thing is this got quoted it, not that paper, but another one is a crucial source in attackers of the hockey stick. And right? that's how I know about it. Weird. Now, one more category is what I call science noise. This is where there's good science, but it goes through the media. And by the time it gets to the public, it's there's noise and over interpretation and exaggeration and, and whatever. And, you know, that's always a problem. But the focus of what I do is chase anti-science. That is not just pseudo or noise, although they use them whenever they can, but deliberately created ignorance intended to obscure science because they don't like the policies. So in studying who does what, I found there were a small number of professionals who actually get paid for this that create the anti-science memes, and many amateurs uh, repeat it and believe it. Now, of course, Folks like Sagan Gardner or Steve Schneider were real skeptics in the normal science sense. Climate deniers like to call themselves skeptics. I would say they're pseudo-skeptics. I wrote a blog post about that. I'd say they have Sauron class Morton's demons. What are those? They're demons that sit on your shoulder and defend you from any ideas you don't like. So things should work like on the left. You get science accumulates, you get reviews, they write assessment reports like IPCC does for climate or the US, various US agencies do, or the Surgeon General for tobacco. You hope that information goes to governments and the public and rational decisions are made. Well, you'd like it to work that way, but it doesn't because some people don't want the uh, policies that uh, would be uh, proven by the science. And so you generate anti-science fog, a lot of noise. You try to get good studies thrown in the trash and avoid the, um, uh, the policies you don't like. Now, sadly, in 1990, climate issues were pretty nonpartisan, but it was manufactured since. And um, the, the fossil entities managed to lock climate anti-science on top of the Republican Party. And that's pretty sad. There actually have been some well-known Republicans who were quite strong defenders of climate science, but they're harder to find these days. So where did modern anti-science really get rolling? I mean, there were earlier things like for lead and asbestos, but the tobacco companies really raised it by their uh, public relations expertise. So Hill and Knowlton is a big PR agency that laid out the strategy for the tobacco companies uh, back when they knew the science was coming after them. And uh, they gave a bunch of advice and you could see them there. And of course, uh, those things get used uh, all over the place in other areas. Often the same think tanks, fund organizations, or even people. Uh, physicists like Fred Seitz or Fred Singer, who were in uh, Merchants of Doubt, uh, uh, also did things for the tobacco companies. Ivar Giaver is a Nobel physicist who was a climate denier. It turns out he did work for Philip Morris. So these are not tax-free nonprofits, uh, some of the entities, but they really act more like PR and lobbying agencies. Now, not all are that way. There actually are some pretty reasonable folks at the Hoover Institution uh, who've done some good climate stuff. Okay, so uh, I'll give you an example. I don't try to read this, um, but what I did is I took Robert Proctor's uh, book, uh, Golden Holocaust, one of the best things on the tobacco industry. And he had a tobacco playbook, and, and that's on the left. <coughs> what I did was just edit the red in and, and change the tobacco stuff into climate stuff. It's all the same structure. It's the same general ideas. I mean, it's really all the same tactics. 
Now, I wondered if the uh, think tanks were still doing this around about 2014. I found an interesting uh, change is uh, th they had always been saying, well, smoking is an adult choice, which is untrue. It's a teenage um, mistake. Um, it's adult choice. It's freedom. It's liberty. Uh, you, you know, people shouldn't raise taxes or bother them. Okay. And then in 2013, in a space of six months, they all changed to say, well, we know smoking is bad, but e-cigarettes could be helpful. And the problem is, it was right when the big tobacco companies decided they were going to have to be in um, e-cigarettes. And they told them, and there they went. And wonderful marketing. I mean, you know, it's supposedly not for kids. That's why there's gummy bear, you know, flavored e-cigs, right? Okay, so now let's look at the machinery itself. Um, and this is an overview of it. And I'll go through each piece and talk about it. The idea is there's funders at the top. There's an interconnected group of PR people and lobbyists and things. And they move around and uh, they all talk to each other. And uh, th they, they work with spokespeople and they launder the memes. Okay. And I think Mark Boslow mentioned uh, meme laundering. Okay. They generate some ideas and then the think tanks promote them and they try to get them into the media and uh, in the, in the public and, and convince convincible people that all this global warming stuff is hogwash. So let's go through the pieces. So money comes from corporations or family foundations like the Koch Foundation or the uh, Sarah Scaife Foundation or Bradley Foundation. It goes into this sort of cloud where it gets hard to find. There's a reason Jane Mayer's book was called Dark Money. Okay. Now, I mentioned this Donors Trust Anonymizer. That wasn't in the chart I did in 2009 because I hadn't found it yet, but it's a great anonymizer for keeping you from knowing who's giving money to what. The money sometimes goes to lobbyists and directly to politicians, uh, but it often goes to think tanks because they can have resident scholars and senior fellows that sound you know, pretty, uh, uh, pretty credible. Okay, now down below, what you try to go get is spokespeople that sound like they're credible. The most credible would be a scientist in the field itself. Uh, there aren't very many like that that are willing to generate uh, untruths. In other words, this goes beyond the normal arguments that go on. Scientists argue all the time. But uh, when you completely reject something that's an overpowering consensus and you have to break the laws of physics, you're, you're doing something else, right? Now, the next best are scientists, at least with PhDs, even if they don't have much to do with climate science. And if you can't get them, then maybe technical professionals. Uh, and then you just get general communicators and you try to generate memes and then they get promoted through uh, uh, think tanks and front groups and uh, through uh, uh, publications that are friendly to this stuff. So that gets down into the media. I, I, when I wrote this first time, it was the blogosphere. Now it's Twitter and Facebook and other things. And the idea is you're trying to get the uncommitted public to be convinced that climate change is a hoax. Now, there's a great set of polls that Yale and George Mason University do called Six Americas. They've been doing it for more than 10 years. And they end up splitting up American opinion into six groups, and the size of them is over at the right. And what they're trying to do is move people sort of from the middle who are doubtful or cautious into the dismissive group, which just is absolutely convinced fossil fuels forever, and we don't have to worry about anything, and climate scientists are a cabal that are trying to fake us out and, and, and so forth. I strongly recommend the Six Americas work. You go to Yale and look for Six Americas, you, you find this stuff. And of course, what they're also hoping is that the people who are really convinced of that will go do political support back up uh, uh, to their politicians and keep them under pressure. So it's not just the money coming to the politicians, it's the political support from pretty outspoken people in the dismissive category. 
Now, another view of this un unfortunate political split, Larry Hamilton's a fine sociologist at uh, University of New Hampshire, and they do polls all the time. And here's one where they split four ways, Democrat, Independent, Republicans, other than uh, Tea Party and Tea Party okay, uh, Orange there. And then they ask science questions like, did humans evolve? Uh, uh, is climate change you know, caused by humans? Do scientists agree? Uh, is Arctic ice decreasing? Is CO2 increasing? And I think the results are pretty consistent is that you know, the the Democrats tend to have the highest level of acceptance uh, and the Tea Party part of Republicans have the least. The one place where that changes at the bottom is how well do you understand the science? And there the Tea Party um, contingent believes it knows more than anybody else does. OK, I'm, now I spent some time in studying blogs and books and so forth to try to understand what reasons there were for climate denial. And that took a while. Um, but I, I, I made a catalog of reasons I'd seen and different people had different combinations of them. And I'll just sketch this. But if you're interested, you go to the Crescendo for Climate uh, or Climate Gate, Cacophony for Climate Gate, uh, a cacophony and uh, and take a look at that and it goes through all this stuff. So it could be financial reason. The the, the fossil fuel executives have a pretty strong financial interest in being against climate science. But in terms of ideology matters a lot more for a lot of other people. And sometimes politics, right? It can be used as a wedge. Like for some people you say Al Gore and, you know, what doesn't matter what else you say, it's got to be wrong. Uh, psychology comes up more than climate anti-science than in tobacco, I think. Right? Um, you sometimes get people who are contrarian or uh, by nature, even uh, just if, 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 if they're told there's a consensus, they're immediately against it. In other cases, it may get more attention or publicity. Just agreeing with a consensus doesn't get you much um, publicity. But if you want some, you claim that you've uh, that you've. Uh, uh, killed the consensus. And then there's ego effects. There's Dunning-Kruger, uh, where people just are incompetent, don't know it. You often see this on Twitter or in blogs, where people who obviously don't know the first thing about climate science will tell some literally world-class expert that they know more than that expert does. And then there's other reasons, too. And then finally, with from people within the field, sometimes people take an early position and just absolutely refused to change. Uh, Ronald Fisher is a very famous statistician, and he just never accepted the statistics of, uh, of uh, uh, tobacco and, and cancer. Okay, another one like that would be Richard Lindzen, who decided that that CO2 didn't really matter about 30 years ago. And is, even he's a very smart guy, but he decided that he's never changed. And then there's other reasons that can happen. Okay, another eye chart. <laughs> this took a lot of work to, to find as I looked at, uh, ba basically, I was looking at climate denial think tanks, and then I looked at where where money was going to them. And across the top, I marked them T if there was a tobacco connection and dollars if I said something about their funding here. Uh, I said N for nonprofit, and most of them are. So they're public charities. Great. Okay. Uh, and then there were some other activities they were in. And then I had things like how much money from different sources did we know for Exxon? And then there were the SCAFE-related uh, uh, foundations. And then there were the Coke-related foundations. And this is one slice of a full page. And there's actually three pages because there's 100 different think tanks. Uh, you know, So it, it looks like an eye chart, but it... it to find out what's going on, you have to look at a lot of data to find out the patterns. And this is another one like that. Uh, I was looking at the Heartland Institute, and I found there was a Philip Morris executive on their board. And I said, oh, I wonder if he's in the industry documents library. And he was, and I was ecstatic. He 
was the guy in charge of doling out money to think tanks. And he did a spreadsheet every year. And I thought, oh, you just saved me so much time, right? And so I took a bunch of the climate denial, mostly uh, think tanks, not all of them, but a few of them, all right? And I, I, I pulled them out of his spreadsheets and there they were, right? And um, yet, you know, they were begging for money and they were always saying, we can help you. And here's how they could help them. Uh, Philip Morris asked a bunch of their think tanks, what can you do for us? We're under pressure. And they got these answers back. And this was from a memo I found that said what they would do. So, you know, they'd do press releases. They'd write to Congress. They'd do op-eds. They'd write position papers. Uh, they'd have off-the-record meetings with the Congress people. And I love the one down at the bottom of access to G.W. Bush. That was when he was a, uh, a governor of Texas. But this is all stuff you can find in the database up there. Okay, now here we got another eye chart, but let me just explain what this means. This is an example of that overall flow that I showed you, where at the top, you've got corporations like Exxon and Philip Morris, and you've got various of the main funders of family foundations. And this shows how the money spreads out from them in this sort of big cloud in the middle. And then it goes to a lot of think tanks and they look like they're separate things and they sort of are, but they all work together. They quote each other. They write papers for each other and articles, right? And they go to each other's conferences and where I call it is if you're into computing, it's a distributed denial of service attack. It looks like a bunch of independent organizations, but all the money to these things comes from mostly the same places. And then there were just examples of all the weird connections there were. Uh, there was a big connection with Michael Crichton's state of fear that made uh, a climate science cabal causing trouble and fearless industrious, you know, managed to chase them down. I mean, what can I say, right? Uh, anyway, there's a lot of weird connections here. And here's another one. So now, let me be really clear. Most of George Mason University is a normal place. There's some great work by John Cook, and who was there for years, and Ed Maybach. And, great, and most of it's a normal place. But there's a few places that are very much the center of Coke land in academe, and uh, also a lot of tobacco connections. Uh, George Mason economics PhDs were the key to the takeover of AIER. And then there's an offshoot uh, of the Great Barrington Declaration, which is completely anti-vax, anti-mask, anti-anything government might do. And that includes uh, economics professor Don Boudreau, who's also a climate denier. He's spoken at Heartland um, and other folks who are connected with uh, 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 with uh, COVID. Uh, if you want to understand why George Mason is important in this, read Dark Money and Democracy in Chains, and you'll see what the connection is. Again, there's just a couple core places in economics and somewhat the law school and a bit in public policy. The rest of it's a normal place, but, but that is the core for Coke. Okay, now... To give you an example of the dark money things, it is hard to find the money. Now, a friend of mine, Bob Brule, who's now at Brown, did a great study in uh, uh, 2013 where he's looking at the foundation funding of the various uh, climate change denial uh, uh, groups, right? And he gave the numbers here. The interesting thing he found, uh, and I had told him about the, the donors trust thing, was that over the decade, uh, you know, of uh, say, 2002-2010, um, the money going directly from these guys to these think tanks slowly decreased, didn't do much, but there was a big increase in money that was flowing to them by a donor's trust, where now you can't tell who really was giving it to them. That is, you could see if the Koch Foundation gave money to donor's trust, but you couldn't tell where it was going, okay? So um, it, it, as an anonymizer, it worked very well, and actually they're doing more of it through other donor-advised funds. Dark money is hard to find. Well, here's weird other connections. I said there was a connection with vaccination. Now, we all know that COVID vaccination uh, and, and various measures that, uh, that Trump 
you know, wasn't so good on those and locked that into the Republican Party, unfortunately. But actually, it started earlier. Uh, Senate Bill 277 in California required vaccine, more vaccinations for school with only medi real medical exemptions. And uh, Senate Bill 7 raised the legal tobacco age to 21. And these are both, honestly, no-brainer kind of things. 80% of the Democrats voted yes on both. 80% of the Republicans voted no or equivalent uh, uh, on both. Now, the latter, if the tobacco part wasn't so surprising because most tobacco money goes to uh, Republicans, especially Republican males. Uh, well, women don't go in for this uh, uh, so much. Um, but, you know, it's not obvious why they were so against uh, vaccination, but they were. So that's actually been here for a while. Okay, let's talk a little bit about tactics of doubt. Uh, oh, Fred Singer, especially who was in uh, Merchants of Doubt, endless petitions. Fred would just, it was like every year or two, Fred would have another petition of somebody saying, no, climate change, no, no, not really, a lot of doubt, a lot of doubt. Famous one is called the Oregon Petition. Art Robinson is a guy who runs a little think tank with his couple sons in the woods in Oregon. And um, uh, they had this big petition with thousands of people who signed. Of course, many were unverified and hardly any were real climate scientists, uh, but they were sure, you know, climate change wasn't happening. And the Great Barrington Declaration at AIER is pretty similar to this. Uh, there were individual attacks. The Wall Street Journal attacked Ben Santer, um, and stirring people up that he found an eviscerated rat on his doorstep. And Ben is one of the nicest guys I've ever met. I just didn't deserve that. There was these attempts to subvert science societies, uh, and there were at least four of them I know of. Um, and I talked and helped some of them to, you know, fend these off because this, you know, this is just not normal for science societies, but there was organized, there were organized efforts to mess up their uh, climate positions. Uh, then there were subversions of peer review uh, and a PAL review, but then they would blame scientists for doing that. It was pretty, pretty inverse of what was really going on. There was at least a decade long attack on the hockey stick and particularly Mike Mann. He often uses the term Serengeti strategy. That is, it's like if the lions want to go after a bunch of gazelles, they pick one and, and chase it. So they do this with scientists is there may be a report that's done by a large number of people and it has a consensus, but they'll pick one for endless attacks. So the, this Wegman report was organized actually by two of the uh, conservative think tanks, the George Marshall Institute and the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and a representative from Texas, Joe Barton. And, uh, you know, it made, again, a show trial in Congress and is heavily, heavily referenced in a whole lot of those climate denial books that I showed you early on uh, as, see, you know, a major statistician says it was all wrong. Well, well it, you know, it wasn't a, and it was a, a terrible report. Uh, there's bogus academic misconduct points. There's lawsuits. Um, the the uh, Virginia Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli uh, chased Mike Mann and University of Virginia for years with just completely nonsense lawsuits, claiming it was fraudulent work and demanding every email that had ever been sent and every bit of work for something that was many, many years old. Uh, uh, amusingly, I mentioned I got sued. Uh, well, the lawyer that Wegman and Said used what had been Cuccinelli's law partner, which I thought was an interesting coincidence. Then there was ClimateGate in 2009-2010, where a bunch of emails were stolen and misrepresented to the public. People who knew the science knew they weren't causing doing anything bad. They were just normal discussions, but they would cherry pick uh, snippets of text out to, uh, to try to embarrass people. There's internet amplification of attacks, and this can get really ugly. So a guy named Mark Morano posts scientist's email address, and then there's a wave of hate mail. Okay. He has plausible deniability. I just mentioned their email, but he knew what would happen. Anyway, scientists have learned climate science legal defense funds 
the Legal Defense Fund uh, has done a lot of good work to, in educating scientists about their rights and being ready to support, and I think has suppressed a lot of suits. Uh, there are some libel suits going on. Those are hard. There's one of Mike Manns that started in 2012, still going on. And there's, again, there's been more help for good communication and help on defense. Okay, so here's some advice for scientists and the more public science supporters. Okay, some for scientists and some for the rest of us. So, good thing to do, see the movie Merchants of Doubt, which covers more topics than just what the book did. It is really an interesting movie to, to see. Um, uh, and it'll make you angry, but uh, that's angry in a good way. So every scientist, I tell this to every scientist who gets depressed, hey, y'all need some media training uh, and keep an eye on your own institution's press releases because sometimes they, they do crazy stuff. Some of you got to do public outreach and get good at it. And actually many scientists do. A few will spend a lot of their time on outreach and policy, guys like Steve Schneider, okay, right, who was truly wonderful at this, and truly very good scientist and a terrific community, communicator. But scientists got to keep doing the science. The rest of us can't. The rest of us got to help get the, the deniers off scientists back. Apply good skeptical thinking, learn some science, and give some moral support. More than once, I've gotten an email from some scientist saying, you know, it really means a lot to me that somebody out there cares. And, you know, Send people email or support them on Twitter or whatever. Uh, it makes a difference because they get a lot of flack. Uh, good person to look at if you're into the communication end is Susan Joy Hassel. She's taught courses and this stuff. She's really good. So scientists are not alone. Uh, attacks are really badges of honor. But you got to got to immediately ask advice from people who know this war. And I mean, I've sometimes spent hour and a half on phone with somebody who suddenly gets attacked from nowhere and um, with a deluge of hate mail. Okay, another thing to do is avoid, never ever do a debate with a confuser. They just have too much advantage. They'll use this thing called a gish gallop, which of course was coined by Jeannie, uh, where they'll just spray confusing stuff at people. Now, I know, I think I know how to do a real debate with slides, which is more like having chess clocks and things where you have to exchange and annotate slides so you can immediately challenge things. Uh, and then the moderator runs the computer and you have to use all the slides, uh, but no pro would ever agree to this because uh, they can't get away with stuff. But this is how you use skeptical science, for instance. Um, I, and I've done this. You say, I'm glad to answer questions, but if you ask one that's already well answered, have been answered for 10 years, I'll just give you the numbers and the list. So you're not evading the question, but the thoughtful listeners see that these things are old bad jokes. Right, and that also saves time for real questions. And uh, I did one radio call when where the first guy had three things gish gallop, and it would have taken the whole time to answer, but my answer was three numbers. So rocks into gears. People don't they don't like it when you expose nonsensical things that are done. Uh, that's what got me profiled in science. Will Happer says I'm a destructive force. I actually publish stuff online. Well, the 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 petition that they were doing got 200 out of 47,000 people. And they made a huge amount of noise about it. There was never any peer review. It never would have passed peer review. And I published a blog post. Well, you know, okay. Uh, so now he chairs the Marshall Institute that was in Merchants of Doubt. He was not happy with this. Okay, Bjorn Lomborg didn't like the fact that I pointed out that the Copenhagen Consensus Center was a storefront in a, in a, a Massachusetts uh, town. And um, uh, and it was really, I, I thought, a foreign conduit for money to ship over to him wherever he was. Okay, academic misconduct complaints. I've done some of those and caused some trouble. Again, I end up with $2 million lawsuits, but it failed badly and they withdrew. I tried complaints to the IRS, but it's very hard to do much with those, unfortunately. I said this was like distributed denial of service. They like to have a lot of small think tanks and they're too small for the IRS to bother with. I actually got a ways on with one of these, but IRS is underfunded for chasing uh, funny, um, uh, uh, funny use of uh, 
uh, charity type uh, uh, entities. Uh, there are some good things happening with uh, online quick response fact checking, like Repustar is an interesting new one uh, on Twitter. You might look for that one. Now, legal issues. We did this uh, uh, big uh, two-day workshop, very intense at Scripps, and I mentioned it before, and the reports there, um, and it was to look at legal routes to put pressure on the fossil fuel companies. And I think, you know, that's the ancestor of some of the lawsuits you now see on uh, against the fossil fuel companies. Of course, meanwhile, big coal companies have been going out of business or at least going in bankruptcy. And, you know, coal was under a lot of a lot of pressure. Uh, I'll point you at this one down below. Uh, uh, the lady uh, who... Uh, prosecuted the tobacco companies for the DOJ, Sharon Eubanks. She's a friend of mine. She's just terrific. She's sweet and nice and tough as nails, man. She's just wonderful, right? And so thank goodness people have been asking her for comments uh, because, uh, you know, she knows how these things work. And I think more of this may happen. So let me finish up. Uh, you know, tobacco built a lot of anti-science machinery and it worked pretty well. And they locked it to the politics, political identity, uh, which is really unfortunate when anti-science gets gets completely locked on top of, of, of strong political things. But and unfortunately, fossil fuels follow that and so is anti-vax. So, but environmental anti-science inherited all this stuff. And again, tactics organizations, sometimes the same people. It's a little harder to find the funding. We knew who the tobacco companies were, uh, but sometimes the money going into climate denial is harder to find. But climate scientists over the last couple of decades have learned about this better. They've allied with social scientists, investigative journalists and bloggers who are much better positioned to go spend their time chasing things down. Climate science want to do climate science. They don't, they don't want to go digging through IRS forms like guys like me. Right? So um, legally actionable things are starting to happen. Uh, we've gotten other rocks in the gears now and then. We hope it doesn't take as long as it did for tobacco because warming is, is permanent. And once again, I, I'm very sad that... Uh, Science used to be nonpartisan, and now parts of it are, are badly partisan locked. So thanks. I want to thank the Industry Document Library. Terrific help up there. Uh, they've added, you know, chemicals, food, drugs, fossil fuels. So I'll answer the question. How, why do you get 19,000 hits for Exxon in just the tobacco section? Well, it turns out 60% of the cigarettes in the U.S. are sold through gas stations and convenience stores. And um, the tobacco companies are very attentive at the local level to every gas station. And have, you see all these reports from local people about how good the displays are and how they're doing. So, uh, I hope you found this interesting, even though I know it was a lot of material, but uh, there should be enough references in here. If you want to dig around and see if you believe me or not, um, that's it. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, I really had to chuckle when I heard you talk about uh, debate techniques. Um, you, you mentioned that you have had a fair amount of success in just referring people to uh, skeptical science as, as a wonderful resource. And any listener who is interested in, in climate science and some of the uh, attacks on climate science and good refutation should really know skepticalscience.com. It's really a wonderful site. But the same thing has happened to me um, in the creationism issue. I remember giving a talk once at a university somewhere and there was a couple of students in there that clearly had um, gotten a hold of a lot of the creationist literature and the, the parallel is very comparable and this one kid just had a whole list of things and he was just going down the list he said well what about what about meteoritic meteoritic dust on the moon and so i explained about meteoritic dust on the moon and said there's a really great website called talkorigins.org that you should go to and you'll find the answers to this and many others. Well, what about, um, I don't know what the next one was, um, uh, the lack of transitional fossils. And after a couple of these, I finally figured out, oh, I said, okay, you'll find the answer to that at 
talkingorigins.org, <laughs> just like you were able to refer people. I mean, it's, it's wonderful having resources like that. Yeah, well, I, we, I, I was, was going to say, one of, one we, of the most, we, we skeptics need more, more places like Skeptical Science and Talk Origins. Yes. Yeah, well, one of the fun, most fun examples like that were uh, <laughs> I, I went to a local talk by Nobel physicist Burton Richter, okay, who, who had run Slack here at Stanford for a lot of years. And then he sort of retired and he did climate and energy. Um, but um, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it, was, it was just a local talk here in a, a sort of a town center kind of place. And when he finished, the first half of his talk could have been done by Al Gore. Okay. It was like a lot of the same slides. So at Q and A, two guys, eager beavers popped up and started peppering him with questions. Okay. Right. And they were all, you know, climate denial, classic uh, memes. Right. And so he answered them. He kept answering them. And then finally he said, look, all these things you've said, I know personally the physicists that invented these and they went to the dark side and I don't think much of them because he knew, the people from Merchants of Doubt, okay, right, that came out, and I knew who they were, right, and and, and the guys went, oops, maybe Nobel physicists know more than I do, you know, and they slunk <laughs> in their chairs, and when we broke for coffee, they just sort of walked out without talking to anybody, and that, I mean, it it was interesting to see. <laughs> I knew John Kennedy, and you, sir, are no John Kennedy. Yes. <laughs> um. You know, there's an awful lot of people who don't really know anything about ClimateGate. Um, it's, it happened long enough ago that I think there's probably a lot of younger people watching this program that really aren't familiar with that. Would, could you describe a little bit more about ClimateGate and why it was such a problem? And I think it's not as big a problem anymore because of the kind of, you know, responses that you've made. But could, could you just spend a couple minutes telling us a little bit about that? Sure. So what happened was that um, somebody hacked uh, the system at the University of East Anglia, which is a good center for climate change analysis. Okay, And they dug up years worth of emails. Right? Now, climate scientists argue all the time. Right? <laughs> they're and scientists, I'm, right? Yes, they're <laughs> scientists. Okay, right. And, and I'm, you know, I... I know a lot of, I know a bunch of them and I'm in some of the conversations and everything. Okay. All right. So, and they, they use terminology that, that if you know the field, you know exactly what they mean. Okay. But if you pull out a few snippets of conversation, you can make anybody look bad. Okay. And that's what somebody did. And, and you know, they didn't dump the whole set of conversations, they sort of dumped some of them with things they thought made them look bad, right? And it was right before one of the big uh, 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 big climate meetings and caused a lot of trouble for it. And it was a huge amount of stuff in the press, okay, right? And it started up a bunch of attacks on Mike Mann, okay, right? Uh, and that was organized by one of the think tanks in uh, Pennsylvania, funded by Richard Mellon Scaife, okay, right? And uh, they organized, they, they had all these sort of completely... You know, Un, unproven, un, undocumented academic misconduct complaints, you know, uh, it, just, it, it just was nonsense, okay? And uh, actually, that's how I sort of got involved is I, I um, uh, Mike said, hey, can, you're an old Penn Stater, can you write to them because you know, understand this stuff, you know? And I wrote a letter to the Penn State president explaining how these kinds of attacks work because universities are not really quite, we're not used to this thing, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then I asked some friends like Don Kennedy, who was the editor in chief of science. Okay, all right. And he wrote a letter and, and they included his letter in the inquiry report, which was good. Okay, right. So that was nice, right? And um, uh, it, uh, but, but, you know, there were, there were inquiries or investigations and if, they, if I recall, they were they were just like, settled. It was nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I require, there were like three or four different inquiries, uh, one at the okay. university and then. Uh, I'm trying to remember some well, of the Well, it was other. Ron Oxborough's in the UK, all right? Yeah, yeah, that's so right. The, the NSF looked at the stuff. I mean, there were, there were six or eight investigations. Yeah. And the answer was there was nothing wrong, okay? Right? No, and no, they're there. There was nothing it, there, okay? It was basically taking things out of context, which... Yeah, or, or they, they would chop out words. I, yeah, it's, it's funny because 
I always used to tell when I was working, I would always tell my staff, don't put anything in an email that you would not want to see on the website of the Discovery Institute or the Institute yeah, yeah. of Research. Um, however, people, and, and we had a fairly tight ship. I don't think we did a whole lot of snark at NCSC, but you know, let's face it, in your personal email, a lot of times people will be, shall we say, informal and yes. will be snarky and snotty and, and uh, you know, say things that maybe they would not say if it was going to be on the website of an opponent organization. And, you know, these people snap at each other, people get mad at each other and they swear. And, you know, and these kinds of things were pulled out to make them seem like, you know, petty little um, uh, thin skinned uh, 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 hothouse flowers that couldn't take some ribbing. At any rate, uh, yeah, the, the whole climate gate situation was a very sad chapter. Yeah, and well, it's, uh, yes. fortunately, it seems to have blown over at least uh, at, partly as a result of all of these kinds of, of explorations. Indeed. Um, Jay, do we have any questions for, from our audience? Jay asks, money from any source doesn't necessarily mean dishonesty, but certainly implies influence. Given that, why do you th what do you think is the real value of following the money? Oh, uh, well, I, th I think... So, so let's see how this really works, right? And and the reason that I can know this sometimes is in particular with the tobacco companies. You can find the conversations where they're begging for money, okay, right? And um, the, the 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 way the way this often works, it's not so much that a funder says, "I want you to do X, Y, and Z." Okay. It's that that the think tank kind of knows the things it should be doing, and it will say, "Well, we did this and this and this, so give us some more money." Okay, right? And there's clearly con when you read the the kind of documents like this, you can see you you can see the guiding that's going on. Is it? And, and you can see these comments in these spreadsheets I mentioned, like they did a good job this year. Okay, right? Here's what they're going to do for us, right? Um, so, so if you look at it, this is why I called it meme laundering, is that you would get these ideas and you want them to come through somebody that sounds, you know, they are an institute, right? Okay, they're a foundation, okay? They have senior fellows. They have, you know, scholar in residence, okay? Well, you know, they're, they're basically pseudo-academic, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's not so much that that somebody says to the Heartland Institute, we want you to do X. It's that Heartland says, well, here's some things we'd like to do, you know, and then maybe they have a phone con conversation that says, yeah, we like that. Okay, right. But if they don't do things that are, are th that the funders like over time, the money goes down. Okay, right. So it's, it's a funny kind of control and it's, you know, there's a reason this stuff is called dark money. Right. I mean, as it is, we often can only find 25 to 40 percent of the money that comes into these think tanks that we can actually identify. Right. And uh, and, and worse now with donors trust. Pardon? Even worse now. Yeah. Well, it's even worse now. And, and they're using some of the big donor advised funds like Schwab. OK. Right. And you can't find anything in there. I mean, you know, you're just OK. Right. So. So, I mean, it's very clear if you watch what they do, right? Well, you know, another example was that one about the e-cigarettes, right? It's very mm -hmm. clear that that Reynolds and Philip Morris, who are the ones who generally funded the think tanks, okay, all told told the think tanks, you know, in the space of about six months, hey, you got to change your message on smoking. Because right? they've been had they had the same message for for decades, right? Uh, and it just all of a sudden changed. And that that website I pointed at, you know, had examples of that stuff. Yeah, the um, one of the one of the cardinal uh, uh, recommendations in nonprofit management is set out what you want to do, and don't just don't change your mission to chase the money. But 
it happens all the time. And this fits rather into what you're saying. If you are a nonprofit and you want, or some other institute, most of them are C3s, and you want to get some funding, well, you look around and you see, well, SCAFE is funding this this year and Coke is funding this and um, Shadow Foundation XYZ is funding that. And gee, we've got a program that would fit just nicely with that and we'll gin it up and we'll apply for it. So, you know, it's, it is a very subtle kind of shaping. It's not so much that the money corrupts, it's that the money is this huge big beacon on the horizon that you're just going to try to make it straight line to. Well-run nonprofits don't do that. We have a question from Stuart. This is a two-part question, it looks like. It seems that their spending money via donations to nonprofit organizations serves to leverage their money, yes? Yes. Would it be possible to expose these nonprofit organizations for their roles in misusing funds? Yes. <laughs> I've written hundreds of pages, okay, right? and so have some other people. So, so the the pro the problem comes of try, and, and I talked about this with the IRS, okay, right? It is, you know, what you really want is for the IRS to remove their uh, 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 their non tax exempt status. Yeah, okay? the tax exempt status. But the problem, the problem, is, and and I tried that with a couple of them, right? And I actually got a ways with Heartland. I mean, the issue is, wait a second, here's all this evidence that an that a nonprofit takes a lot of money from tobacco companies to help addict teenagers. I mean, you know, how can that be a nonprofit public charity? Right. But it, it's it's you know, it's pretty hard. But the trouble is, a thing like Heartland is about five million dollars a year. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, They're not and, huge. They're it's not, not huge. Okay. So unlike, for instance, in Canada, there's one really big think tank called the Fraser Institute. But the US, there's like at least a hundred of these things. There's more than that, but but they come and they go, and they're you know, most of them are relatively small. Things like Cato or, or Heritage are much bigger, but but a whole lot of them are. I mean, some of them are little family businesses, in effect, okay? The Center for the Study of Carbon Dioxide and Global Change is like a family business, all right? Um, I, I mean, so so you can expose them, and sometimes sometimes that causes them trouble, okay, right? Um, I think, you know, I think I've managed to cause Heartland some trouble, okay, right? Um, but it's hard to find legal routes to do something about them, because I tried the IRS route. Yeah, I mean there there there's a there's a free speech element to it too. The Heartland Institute puts out really crummy science. Yes. Uh, they they keep coming up with these in you know, a little booklets that they distribute to teachers, for example. Oh, and yes. science is just awful. And and you know my former organization, I mean the organization is still there. I'm the one who's former. The National Center for Science Education will put out refutations and circulate this to teachers, but we don't quite have the reach that uh, um, uh, that, that um, they have and or the money to send it to uh, uh, every school district in the country. So, you know, money greases a lot of wheels. Money makes it possible yeah. to uh, get a lot of misinformation out there. Now, as it happens, though, Heartland has gone through hard times lately. Hmm? Oh, that's music to my ears. Tell me yes, more. Yes, okay. Uh, it, it's key guy Joe Best retired a few years ago. Uh -huh. I have no idea if this ha has anything to do with it, but he was a heavy smoker. Uh -huh. So maybe, all right. Um, and they've had a series of managements that have come in and gone. And the funding the last year that I've got numbers for is down about 30%. So we'll see. You know, who knows? Start with. Jay, do we have any other questions? How does the average citizen combat the politicization of science? Okay, well, I think I think what one does is okay. Is first off, first off, it helps to start with the um, uh, you know to at least know a little bit about the science, the specific science under consideration. You should kind of find out some, all right? Approach it with a good skeptical mindset, but know what, like, there's a strong consensus that smoking causes cancer. Well, it's pretty strong. Is there a strong consensus among scientists that uh, uh, human CO2 is causing warming? Yep, there is, okay, right? Um, 
But I would suggest that the best single thing I would do, at least on the climate side, uh, is read um, Catherine Hayhoe's Saving mm. Us. Okay, mm. uh, That's a brand new book. Catherine is a truly wonderful person. Uh, you talk to her for 30 seconds. You say, one of the nicest people there is. She's very nice, good scientist, terrific communicator, really able to reach lots of people, very good at figuring out what it is she has in common with somebody and, and reaching to them, okay, and reaching across political divides, okay? I mean, she is just wonderful at that. I mean, she's an evangelical Christian who, with her pastor husband, helps uh, uh, churches do energy efficiency. I mean, you know, okay. Okay. Um, and uh, anyway, that's a terrific book about that. If I had to pick one thing of what can the average citizen do, right, at least for climate stuff, um, th th that's one. Because it definitely is about reaching across political and ideological barriers. Yeah, let's face it. If we only talk to the people who agree with us, we're not going to make much progress. That's right. Not that it's easy, but there you have it. Well, John, I have to thank you for spending this uh, time with us at Bay Area Skeptics. We really appreciate it. It was um, an exceptionally stimulating uh, evening. I think there will be a lot of us who will go to the web, to the YouTube site for Bay Area Skeptics and be squinting at <laughs> the, <laughs> the references and the links and so forth. And um, it's a um, You've given us a lot to chew on and a lot to think about. Sure, well, thanks Jay, for having can I me. Have, uh, my last, excuse me. Yes, you had a comment. I just said thanks for having me. Oh, it was my pleasure and our pleasure for sure. So, those of you watching, be sure to join us next month on the second Thursday of the month, Thursday, December seven, same time, same station. Not same station. We'll send you a new. Uh, we'll circulate a new um, URL. Archaeologist A.J. White will talk with us about lost civilizations, which is a really quite wonderful trope that all skeptics have run into. Um, A.J. does uh, research on, if you're from the Middle West, you know about Cahokia. It's a huge, huge Mississippian site outside of St. Louis and a fascinating place. Where did these people go? They disappeared. It is a lost civilization. Well... <laughs> Tune in next month to find out what a real scientist has to say about this. Hope to see you then, and thanks very much for joining us tonight. Good night.